subject and this is Peter Clossin, friend and colleague, and Dan Mann, so we should have sort of done that first. Peter. Okay, I, I mean, because many, many people, you know, look at this sort of title like that, post avant-garde marginality, and think, where, where is it coming from? What, what is it about? Um, and basically, it's, uh, it's a reaction to uh, what the modern was, which where, where the postmodern has come from. Um, and basically, we know that the modern is creating a, a utopian fabric, which hopefully was going to create a utopian society. Now, this blatantly has failed, you know, as we all know, post Thatcher, post 1980s, etc. Um, and then the postmodern, their, their sort of behavioural uh, solution was really to try and create a level playing field um, so that all is equal. Everybody has, has a voice. But that also as a, as a solution, this, and this is my position where I'm coming from, uh, is quite sort of superficial and really based upon uh, sort of external uh, or outward, outward appearances. Um, because what it doesn't do is sort of acknowledge the, the link between uh, the production and the maker uh, and, and the market itself, as, as we live in it, you know, which is a capitalist market. Um, and modernity, um, or marginality, uh, within the title, really is about freedom to choose. Freedom to choose what it is you want to do. Uh, and art doesn't exi exist in a vacuum, but in a competitive and it's in a complex, minutiae sort of way. It, it's a reflection of society. I mean, you know, society isn't sort of just one uh, sort of level. And also, uh, when we're dealing with art, art changes very slowly. It's often art changes beyond the lifetime of a single individual. You know, whereas we live in a time where there is continuous change, or we believe in continuous change. Uh, and my other position is that the avant-garde, as we know it, uh, has become quite dead. You know, the avant-garde itself is now unchanging. It's a mere stage set. Um, and the change that we are going through lies outside, again, this is my own viewpoint, what I regard as the centralised mafia that control the art world at present, you know, the world that we now live in. And that the gap to me, the solution would be that the gap between above and below, it needs narrowing, it needs bringing together, that the macro and micro make more, uh, are made more equal, and that with interchange and dialogue, uh, these gaps are, are sort of narrowed. So that, broadly speaking, is my, is my position uh, on, 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 on the question, really, of what post-avant-garde marginality is. Can, can I say um, that most of us have an arts background here? and are therefore fully qualified anarchists and should feel able to interrupt at any point mm. with any remark you want to make or any question you want to ask. Like, rubbish! <laughs> <laughs> well, no, can I, can I say that was, that was very interesting, the, the notion of that avant-garde being ossified now, as of course it is. But I'm not sure about, you say that art changes very slowly. Well, it, it's, I, I think within, uh, if I you know, look sort of historically, um, then I, I, I think as, as with um, uh, culture uh, sort of in, in general, I mean, it, it, it's often you know, beyond the person's, person's lifetime where, where real change occurs. 
I mean, we, I, I think we are sold the idea of change today. I mean, to me, a great example is with the motor car. I mean, if you pay £10,000 for a motor car, no matter what the external shape of it is like, you're going to get the same sort of product. If you pay £25,000, so on and so on. You know, that we are sold the idea that things are different, mm. uh, but they're not. You know, underneath the surface, they are, they are the same. And what I find interesting in terms of, you know, the avant-garde is how the real early modernist avant-garde or mid-19th century onwards avant-garde in its day um, was practically unseen. You know, people, people sort of outside of the loop hardly knew about it. Today, it's in museums, it's institutionalised, you go along, you worship it, or it's made into a circus, etc., etc. By the postcard. By the postcard, yes. So, yeah, so that's why I say, you know, for me, the avant-garde, uh, as, we, uh, as, as we sort of know it, is, is died a death, completely died a death. Can I ask you? Please, please. Uh, when you're talking about change, and I'm not going to accept it as well, mm. when you're talking about the rate of change, to what extent has the impact, say, of changing technologies, changing um, ways in which art is communicated, has that then meant that the role of the artist, who is an artist, has been changed what implications does that have? In other words, I imagine that traditionally there have been artists who paint and do all those sorts of things and there's been much more clearly delineated communities and therefore much more sort of clearly um, uh, sort of clear pure spheres in which to communicate. Now in the modern world, many different ways in which you communicate. You don't have to be able to do all this stuff, which I am not at, but I can't do this, but now with modern change, can I now be an artist? In another way, and what are the implications for that in terms of implications for change of artists, but also the role that that might play in changing or you know, putting these gaps closer together? It would seem to me that you can be anything you like, depending on who you can reach. We yeah. can all put out stuff, but yeah. who's looking at it? Yeah. Tell me this is influence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitions are a matter of who's defining them. So if you want, I mean, traditionally, if you want to say you're an artist, I think you can. But but you're the technological well, user. How, how do you know who's receiving your um, message? Yeah. Do you care who's receiving your message? Huh? Do you care who's receiving your message? Uh, I think you've got to accept sort of, even if it's artificial, yeah. in narrative framework, you never have any sort of... I, I don't have a problem about who is or is not an artist. Yeah. You know, I mean, I do believe that we are all artists. We all have that capability. Like we're yeah. all mathematicians, we all have that capability, etc., etc. I mean, yeah. you know, it's there. What I have a problem with: who makes the definition? Who defines you as an artist? Who defines who or is not art? And that's where I have my problem because I feel today it's totally state controlled. Yeah, it's been centralised. Yeah, it's um, been totally centralised. Can you describe that a little bit more to Dave, who's not in that world? Okay, well, I, I mean, the, um, the, you know, the fact that uh, young art students today, um, they're not sort of uh, step outside a certain postmodernist sort of aesthetic. Um, in other words, if they're drawing or painting, they've got to appear as dumb as possible. They've got to appear as if they've been, you know, it's been done by a two-year-old, etc. They can't, I mean, I'm... I'm being sarcastic here, but they cannot appear at, uh, sort of step outside a certain postmodernist aesthetic because they'll be they'll be marginalised. Okay. They won't be looked at. They won't be picked oh, yeah. up. I mean, the I mean, if a lot of the so-called avant-garde that is produced today is financially dependent, and you get the finances through central government, through the arts council, through funding, and many artists, many successful artists, are those people who are very good at making funding applications. That's one of the other questions, I think, and again, I don't know about this, but in my mind, Damien Hughes, for example, is good mm. at marketing, for, for example. Oh, so and yes. Is this a longer yes. point? He's also a very good artist. Well, yeah, but yes. you know, so that's an example, though, yes. of, of also yes. you know, an excellent artist of marketing and business manager. That's also awesome. Yeah. And so is Raphael. Raphael was a very good marketing person. I mean, there's, there's a story of Raphael that he was in terms of commission, but he he, uh, he and his assistants broke into the church and put cartoons all over the walls, you know, before the the uh, clergy walked in to decide which artist they were going to choose. So he was one ahead of the game. You know, he was naturally selected. I mean, I think that's always been the case in terms of uh, people promoting. If they, if, I think if you if you believe in what you're doing, inevitably you will promote it. 
But as I said, it's, my, it's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with who makes, who, de who decides what is or is not art. Isn't there? You know, a, it's become institutionalised. Isn't there a deep? I mean, I'm not an artist at all, and, and, and it's not really thought about this, so apologies in advance for saying something really stupid, but isn't there, a, isn't there a, con a deep contradiction in the two things that have just been said? Because at one level, you know, you're saying it's state and centrally controlled, but actually multimedia and all the technology that's available has never made it easier for people to, to do that. So I agree, but that, that doesn't real, carry it. There's a real sort of... Um, yeah, no, what, the Arts Council funding will, will automatically carry an audience, or certainly a feedback form. Uh, whereas if you're just putting yourself out on, on the internet, as I was saying earlier, you've got no guarantee of an audience at all, unless you've got a broad... Yeah, audience. but, it, but it's, just, it's just interesting, isn't it, to the time when it's, when it's never yes. been easier to, to sell to, to, to it, 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 it to hasn't, market. but you know, yeah. as I wrote to you earlier, I mean, all art is mediated through art dealers, galleries and museums. I was going to say... And, yeah. Unless you have a handle in that. It's not just but, government. Is it? Sorry? It's not just government. The, the other massively conservative force is the distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the galleries, the galleries and so on. Absolutely. Which have become, because yeah. it's, now become, it's now pushed to a much more mass market than we have television talking about art and so yes. on. This produces a kind of mainstreaming of thinking about art and it stultifies everything because yes. no one expects anything really much different from what you find in those things that the hotels buy to decorate their walls with. Exactly. And, and I'd, I'd agree with you on one level about state, um, because, you know, I think anything that the Arts Council has a hand on is a dead hand. Mm. <laughs> kiss of death. And I think as an organisation, it suffers from a kind of cultural outsiders. Yep. They keep reinventing the wheel in terms of proactive kind of funding schemes and so on. But, um, Certain crucial things about uh, art education and the original idea of the founding of the Arts Council, why it was founded. It was founded on, you know, on, with the idea that it would uh, open up art and give art to the people. So the, you know, the founding principles of the state post-war was like the NHS, similar thing, mm. and, and uh, that people could have free art education so anyone could literally become trained as an artist, etc. Now, just to hold on to that for a minute, the market, and you know, there's a very pernicious aspect of this market, which is Sachi's. <laughs> um, and the, the market really, and particularly internationally, controls everything. And really it controls what goes in the museums, the state museums. It's global. Yeah, the state, what goes into the state museums is what's being recognised and validated by the market. You know, they don't decide, the market decides and then they follow suit, by and large. Um, so I think there is a need to reform the state, the way it works, the way it operates, etc. But it does offer in certain circumstances, it offers spaces that the market doesn't offer. Yes, but you know, you, offers grand schemes, etc. Of course, yes, you did have you to realize, be Sorry to interrupt. Did you realize that of the um, the main sort of exhibitions which are held within, I know within London, within the museums and institutions, etc., the government funded institutions, they are often as not displaying artists, Mark Wallinger, etc., and various others who are being represented by something like five galleries in this, in this town. Yeah. So it's, it's like it's a brown envelope. That's my it's point, a, really. Oh, thank you. It's a means of passing state funding yes. into private pockets. Yeah, yeah. By yeah. upping the price, upping their market yeah. price. Yeah. I mean, it's insidious, really. Oh, absolutely. But, but it, it does offer also, in other schemes, spaces that the market does not off offer. The only thing that somebody like Saatchi offers uh, is, is it has this website where it can kind of cherry pick what it wants off. But still gives everyone the opportunity yeah. without and question. It, and it tried to, try, try to create an X factor for the arts, which yeah. was a dismal mm -hmm. failure, yeah. thank goodness. Yeah. Um, Don't get it. Yeah. And, you know, so, so I think, you know, the market is, are, are the gatekeepers. They are the most conservative of all. Um, so I think to put it all on the state, I think, is, is you know, 
I just see them as intertwined. This is like well, two, yeah, two, two heads of the same pockets. animal, really. Yeah. Do you think it depends yeah. where you are as well? I mean, I, I, I work in my, my day job in public services in Suffolk, out in the sticks. And, and, and I would say to you that in terms of accessibility to art, the Arts Council does some really good stuff, really, because actually it opens up space and and opportunity for people to access things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access. It may operate slightly differently in, in an urban and a, 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 a rural context. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah, but I, but I absolutely understand the chasing. I mean, I, you know, I spend my life chasing the, 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 the money, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just find the disparity between you know the sort of the few artists sort of at the top and the 99.9% .9 of other artists is so vast that the gap is so vast. I mean, there's one um, contemporary artist that I read, he's worth 80 million pounds. You know, I mean, a, a loot. That's my point, really. I just wonder whether the, whether the dynamic there between the sort of the, esh the, the higher echelons of mm. the art world in London and the higher echelons and the, the sort of art of the people in a place like I live in, you know, rural mid Suffolk, is, yes. is, is a different. It is And actually, it is trying to say something. The Arts Council offers us opportunities to open space for people in those communities that wouldn't otherwise be there. Yeah. So I think, oh, yes. I think you yes. need to sort of just yes. distinguish between how it operates in different places. Yes. Yeah. So I don't yes. Know. No, I take your point. So I, I do. Don't know. Yes. 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 I think what's interesting is that the, the importance therefore of the margins, the areas where people can work without an agenda being set for them. Um, I mean, I think it's fascinating that the margin, marginal, tends to mean almost being ignored. It. And yet, actually, it's in the margins that the most interesting work as it happens. And if you look at medieval manuscripts, with all these wonderful marginal drawings, they were there just to add value to the importance of the text. And yet, I mean, our interest in the text is the drawings that remain. Mm. But I think the margins offer places for people to work in private, to make commentaries, and so on, in a way which um, is increasingly important. You know, artists, I guess, need the freedom to do what they want to do. And if you are actually part of the making of the inbound industry, you don't have that freedom, however good you may be. Yes. But it sounds like this is really just a, a classic problem with market failure, which you could say it happens in any, many areas. I mean, if you look at water supply and what well, kind of water sure and gas electricity, do you know what I mean? I think that's yes. why this is such an interesting debate, because art's such an emotional thing as well. Mm -hmm. If you're much more emotional about art, then you're good about electricity supply or telecommunication supply. Well, but in many ways it's exactly as boring as yes. a classic economic problem of market failure and then you have for how do you have an effective government regulatory whatever intervention in market failure, which simply is terribly dry and boring, but in fact is what it is about more than all the side. But, but I have to say I think art is a different case. No, that's what I mean. That's why I think it's a really cool. and, and everyone gets fed up with art gets much more emotional for yeah. special treatment. But the fact is no, it's not it's the same they, as anything. Yeah. Require special treatment, yeah, right. and and they are the ones that offer society yeah. not just a piece of work, yeah. but an arena where original thinking is done yeah. in an increasingly dull culture. But that's the problem. It's something which is valued by broader macro society. In fact, very few individuals value that. So therefore, if we've got a market which depends upon individual consumers. They're not going to value that because many of them they don't recognise that, and yet the broader social value. Yeah, it's your it's, 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 it's the social values. The, yeah. the, the buzzword in the, in the corporate community these days is creativity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they're, 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 that's the word they're using. And you know, increasingly they are looking to uh, find people who are coming out of the creative industries to involve in some way, to try and, you know, I mean, to, to try and get things moving and, and innovate, because innovation is the name of the game. You know, Blackberry, that's in the news at the moment. You know, yeah. they they fail to innovate, and they, they've gone. Yes, so but that's, really, that's the way we go in, and that's the way we don't become marginalised. And again, it sounds all very boring and pragmatic, mm -hmm. but that's life. You have to demonstrate, well, this is why we have the value, which I don't doubt. But you have to get that. So you have to buy difficult to jump, difficult to quantify, difficult. Do you mean to spread it throughout society in a more sociological way? Well, no, I, I, I just mean to get it valued as something that yes. you can therefore then have a proper pragmatic boring debate about. Well, how do we make sure that there's one lovely thing which we all value? Mm. Separate to that debate, how do we make sure that that itself is funded and is spread in the market clearly? And I think inevitably 
will fail to make sure that that is distributed because for individual consumers to value that is a is a massive step and also sure, to get someone to value all of that. Yeah. Yeah. What well, you know, why am I gonna pay fifty quid a year for something which may or may not value be of value to society in two centuries? I mean, you know, come on. Exactly. And yet and yet as a social poll we would probably do that. It takes us back to the Medici. I keep getting back to the Medici. Well, well, no, 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 I, don't, I don't know anything else, but they were like um, they, they were benefactors. They, they were benefactors and they were yeah, yeah. dictators. What? Uh, well, so they weren't was. actually. They, they were in a republic and they were elected, yeah. but, but you know, basically they took control. And they, they said art was vital to yeah. their community and they cherished their artists and they ran them through and they drove them out of town, you know. Yeah. But it was very frisky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then anyway, I think that goes back to the challenge of art changing what art has become now that it's all a different way. I think this is the challenge of the yeah. art establishment. I but why, but why should art, but the thing is, I mean, that, that's one of my issues about why, yeah. you know, why should art change, why, why, should, why should change be so important in our society today, other than for capitalist reasoning? Yes, that's, I mean, I think because that's human nature and human nature is to change. Is it? Well, why did the Egyptians live for 4,000 years without change? We don't want to live without change. We don't want to live without change. the experience of change. We don't, we don't like the experience of change, but I mean, we, you know, we, we, we seem to be sort of hooked on the idea that, you know, change is absolutely necessary for progress, you know, that the idea of progress and the idea of change are sort of inter, intertwined. Oh, yeah. and they're they're also, but it's also about yeah. power, isn't it? It's, it power's fundamental to this whole thing, because, you know, the example of the Medici's, yeah. but it, the Medici's, you know, were, were a rising power within a, a medieval system. And they needed new forms of representation, which was about humanism and, and that kind of worldview, that idea, <coughs> which was different from the medieval one, which was controlled by the, the papacy and the church. Um, so there, whilst there was kind of transition and lots of intertwining, the, 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 the Medici saw it in their interest to use that as the means to put forward their ideology, their, their way forward. So, I mean, artists have are constantly being used, if you like, yeah. um, oh. as part of this process of power and validation of power, status, and so on. So um, the relationship of art to power is a very interesting mm. one. Yes, maybe that's what we should be talking about, actually. No, no, no I think the, you know, the aspects, you know, as Tony said before, of marginality you know, is, is really very, very interesting because if you're marginal, nobody is looking at you mm. and if nobody is looking at you in fact you can be far more creative far more inventive than if you have a massive audience expecting you particularly if it's if entwined within the marketplace to produce the same thing again and again and again because it's making money for somebody else you know so marginalizing or being within the margin which is what the avant-garde originally was about it's now in, in the spotlight. Um, you know, I think it's a very, very positive. Well, I can see it's desirable, but how does it pay for my dinner? Well, this is what, this is what you're saying about the, the, the spread of value within society. So that you know, I mean, if if, if you can bring together, you know, the, sort of the micro and the macro, the high and the low, um, then you know, maybe things would be distributed. Uh, and I don't want to sound like a Marxist here, you know, be distributed a little more evenly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, but I mean, I mean that's, that's really what's required. I mean, if, if you, I mean, I don't know, uh, I've never been on the inside of arts funding, but I'd be very interested to uh, sort of see what percentages of the uh, sort of central government, government monies are distributed, uh, sort of, well, as we know, I think within theatre, music, dance, etc., that you know the monies are mainly concentrated on a few institutions or a few outlets, and it's the same within the fine arts, with, within a few few artists. Kevin, there is, there is Kevin Atherton, the artist, performance artist, did a performance where he had a pie chart, and he did just that. All right, so and he worked out the. And, and, and it was amazing because yeah. what it was is that that you know performing arts of one kind or another took this huge slice, especially mm. the building based ones. And then um, out of that, uh, visual arts had a very small slice. But then most of that was in museums and so on. Mm. So work by living visual artists mm. was hardly visible. Because mm. I, I was, I was understood the, the Arts Council. <laughs> I was understood, I mean, it's like the ICA, you know. I was understood the Arts Council, the ICA, was about promoting young, new contemporary arts, you know, for the individual. And I think 
maybe when it originated, it was, as you said, it grew out of sort of Second World War socialism. Um, but today, it certainly, it certainly isn't. I mean, I can't remember the last time, personally, I actually wanted, apart from using the cafe, by the way, the ICA cafe is very, very good. I wanted to go to the ICA to see something. You know, because I, I just yeah. find it's, it's just a complete yawn. Yeah. Really. Actually, it was There's an inherent conflict between the idea of central government funding and the activity of individuals on the margins who are the creative people. It's obviously true that it is only individuals mm. who create works. Oh, yes, exactly. And governments are not the scale of organisation to fund individuals. They don't even know how to talk to small firms, never mind. They only know how to talk with big business. And, and, and alongside that, we have a society in which taste is basically governed by a few people and a few media. And so uh, they, every, they everything is centralized. Yeah. So how, how can we possibly provide any, any uh, support through that mechanism for people? What we need is some other way to, to allow there to be some money in a marketplace, which is for actual paintings, for actual I, I don't have, I don't have, actual I don't, have, I don't have massive solutions <laughs> <friendly. Yeah. laughs> As I understand it, certainly the, the small, tiny bit of Arts Council funding that goes to funding things that aren't buildings and all those big things is all about access. It's all about engagement and access. And, and therefore, there's a sort of conflict in my head between that idea that the most creative things are going to happen at the margin. Because actually, in order to meet the, the funding criteria, you have to come out of the margin and into the main street. But there are some quite interesting examples of obviously quite marginal things, you know, attracting um, funding because there's some, I mean, you know, because there's some other, um, probably the point you're making about people being, you know, people being herded, if you like, to all certain states to use that word. Oh, yes. I wanted to bring up the word yeah. fashion, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, they, they are. I mean, that's what I said about young art students are herded towards a certain way of working. But if you actually uh, go to, um, I mean, there, there is the Cafe Gallery Projects in Southwark, the brilliant open exhibition whereby anybody who takes their work along uh, for yeah. the six pound submission fee, they will put it up on the wall. Yeah. And you've got, if you go to an exhibition of that type, and they're very, very few and far between, um, the sheer diversity of what's going on is phenomenal. Um, so it's, not, you know, it's not been herded into, into a narrow channel. Um, and you know that's the reality. You know that that has always happened. The minutiae is always going on. It is always happening. How you spread that sort of centralised funding to you know enable and to support marginalised art, mm. I do not know. Make I mean, my, but the, my they, question is whether you should. Mm. What on earth has central government to do with that? What we, what, what we lack is an actual live market which is providing money. There's, there's, there's no particular reason why it's got to be a central government activity. Yeah. But it's in the point that this is something, something as we discussed, that it's marginalised because most people don't know, and we're taking to leave for the fact, because of what historical precedent, that in fact the stuff, the marginal stuff that's not valued, in fact, might turn out to be what it's valuable. I mean, a lot of it might turn out to be just crap done on the but there might actually be some gems in there. And the question is, well, who pays the gems? And I actually think that for everything that is government or benefactors, Fine, but the problem with benefactors is you then become a, sort of, you know, at the will of a capricious benefactor. And so... As it's from the will of a capricious like, government. Well, yeah. no, that's right. Yeah. So I think the challenge to you sounds... There's only benefactor. one government that would be quite a lot of benefactors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got much more chance if, we, if the world actually right. benefactors. That's right, so maybe the challenge yeah. is to, to say, well, the markets are, the market relies on the fact you know like any market does that you have people who choose the best mm. in their terms and there is this massive pool that they can draw upon at any time and get stuff cheap from it and you know that's the way markets work. That's yeah. that's the nature of the beast. Mm. Um, so to, to to look for and think about a market solution on its own, I think it's just you know, it's it's a, a non-starter. I think you have to look at ways of either um, forcing the market into reinvesting in some way, 
or you have to do it through the state. And you know, I would, personally, I would abolish the Arts Council because I think it's absolutely mm -hmm. yes. It's a really imploded. Uh, arts. Absolutely, it's um, it's But you need something, I think, that mm -hmm. is uh, state funded or it, or separate from the market in some way. Yeah. Um, where the, the the money that the market makes is siphoned back in through a form of tax, if you like, or whatever it means you want to use. Yes. To siphon it back in to uh, to to keep the to keep the pool moving, pool, yeah. The pool yeah. fertile. Yeah. 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 How do you explain? Well, sorry, it's not oh, yeah, I was just, just about to talk. Sorry, I'd just like to make a point about funding. Um, I think we're getting into the situation now. In fact, we've been in the situation for a long time, where there had been a choice between an American model and a predominantly North European model. And you know what is happening? Of course, we're taking the, the American model. The American model basically means that there was no funding. Uh, there was charitable uh, funding. Uh, there were benefactors. There was this huge amount of benefactorship in, in America. Um, and there's been a complete sort of lack of uh, interest in, in the sort of infrastructure, which is education. And it does seem as if this country has chosen to go into the American model as opposed to the North European model. Uh, for instance, I, I came across a most startling figure last year that the primary school child has 24 pence per child spent on for art education. Uh, I think that's excluding the, the, the actual teaching. Is that per day? That, that, that is per, per year. That, that is the material. That doesn't that buy that your pencil, yeah. That's, it will buy, I think, one, it depends where you buy that, it might buy one or two pencils a year. Uh, I mean, this is scandalous, quite yeah. clear. Now, uh, you're, you're also having a problem uh, in higher education, whereby less and less working class kids can get into studying up. Uh, it, it's, it's the whole question of, of fees, the uh, question that uh, foundation and plus the degree of course which is the best way to approach things uh, is, is you know under attack. Uh, and then of course you have the European model and the European model or the Northern European model uh, is still going to some extent. So you're having a situation whereby there are large amounts of local government funding for local arts projects. Now what happened, you, you're quite right when you talked about the pie chart and funding uh, of the various arts. In fact, the fine arts, so-called, are actually now proportionally better funded than they were in the 1960s. In the 1960s, theatre was hugely funded and highly successful became British theatre. It became the best theatre in the world and it had the knock-on effects of people coming over to visit London, you know, to go and see. Uh, and had a great impact. Uh, the ITA was almost like a sock to, you know, the lack of funding, generally. And what, what I'd like just to bring up is the whole question that, I mean, I remember the situation is still the same. I'll be working alongside, say, a Norwegian student at Hart College. And I said, what are you doing next year? And he said, oh, I'm just going to carry on factory. I said, well, what are you going to do for a job? He said, no, I don't have to go and do a job. The state gives me the money. And providing I'm you know, good enough, and I've got a good degree at this college in South East London, um, what they will do, they will take my work and put it into libraries and to put it into hospitals. And it's precisely the, the question of public art that should be addressed, and needs to be addressed actually by people involved in political situations, and needs to be addressed by the artists themselves, and actually needs, most importantly, be addressed by the people themselves, because that is the way forward to actually have the work out there, to have the quality work out there. So um, are, you, are you saying that in this country we are following the North American model, yeah. rather than the Northern European model? Yeah. In other words, we are not we are not supporting individual artists, and as they I think did in Ireland, or maybe did in Ireland, I'm not sure. Yeah, but are, are you sort of saying that that would be 
a better a better system. I'm suggesting that would be a better well, one. Well, in Belgium, it's yeah. the same as in Norway. In Belgium, the yeah. Norwegian government gives you the money to take your mm. shows abroad and to pay. Yeah. Your See, the trouble, the trouble is that I think Tim is sort of vaguely right, and it's a bit of a generalisation, of course, but I think Tim is sort of right about this, what he's saying. He is right, but um, the problem is that uh, we've gone from having the finest art school network in the world mm -hmm. to not just reducing it, but actually finishing it off. Right, sure. and now we're going light drawing, for example, which I have to think is the grammar of the visual arts is now being taught in studios and private church halls and life drawing classes in people's homes even. The state has failed yeah. art education. It's a serious problem. The problem is, at least in America, I'm not defending the American system, I think it's awful, but at least in America there's this tax break for benefactors. Pool in Dorset, which Tim and I both know, um, they built the Cube, part of all the Pool College. It's a wonderful architect designed mm -hmm. new building. They've closed it as a, as, a, as a gallery because they can't fund running it as a gallery, and yet it's built as a gallery. So now it's reverted back within the college to uh, a computer s system, you know, computer studies or something. I mean, you know, it could only happen in England. You yeah. spend all that money on a purpose built modern gallery. When you think about the amount of artists that are supported. Just in America, there's benefactors. You know, there's a tradition of tax breaks for benefactors. You know, the big museums are given these great collections and so on. We don't have it in this country to anywhere like the same extent. Yeah, we're doing the same with uh, further and higher education going to the American model, which has, is, has a much bigger, um, yep. massive infrastructure, and it has all these trusts and foundations, etc. And we don't have it yet. Can I just say that? Yeah. Be but can I, I just want to follow up on one thing. The, the, why I'm into that, what's going on in, in the art schools is, I was actually present when a dean said to a ceramics department that they were closing down the University of Westminster. So one of the best ceramic courses in the country it has all kinds of international um, prestige and so on. The reason you're being closed down, she said, but quite frankly, is because, because you can't fit pots on one of these and she held up a memory stick. Oh, no. And it's about space and resources <laughs> because that's becoming a premium now in universities because universities are being run by businesses and art schools are being run by businesses and studio space doesn't exist anymore. Everyone's hot desking, you know. Central St. Martin's, you know, it's unbelievable. Right? People have to book their time and tell you. Just go for it. <laughs> I'm very interested in this because I'm sort of at the other end of the, the spectrum. So I, I, I work two local authorities that are you know, by balancing their budgets, this government, whether you think it's necessary or not, and I'm not sure I do, um, are cutting our budgets. And the, the, the prospect is that if they continue to cut them the way they are, then local government will not be able to afford anything other than adult social care by 2020. So the growth in adult social care budgets means that they won't be able to fund anything and the arts is likely to be oh, first out. the first out. So for me, what we're doing is we're looking to see how we invest the money that we have got in a way that generates uh, a return of some sort so that we become more sustainable because the government's saying you're not going to get grant anymore from the central government, you need to be more sustainable. So they want us to grow business rates, they want us to get more houses and get you know, more mm. better income that way. I suppose the question for me is, what, what prospect is there for me as a, as a funder of the arts? That the arts, you know, I, I, I've been having recently conversations with one of our uh, big cultural venues in the area I work in, which is wanting more funding, and, and the director of this particular uh, museum is saying to me, you know, we will always need subsidy. We won't be able to survive without subsidy. And I suppose for me, the question is how... How, how do we exploit the opportunities at the margins in order to enable the arts to be less subsidy dependent? Because that's from the other end of the spectrum as a funder and people, somebody who's advising the politicians who have to mm. fund public art. So I, I, I suppose for me the question is can, can we find a model which unlocks that value, both social and commercial, of the art community that's out there? 
Does that make sense? Yes, that's true. No, I, I think, I think, you, I think, I think you've got yeah. us all thinking frantically yeah. because yeah. you're covering a huge thing and Captain Harris would just see. I don't have a, an ideal solution, but I, I know one of the building blocks of it is the planning system. Um, one of the failings of the planning system, which are probably where the wealth is, I mean, um, is that we, we've not made a legal requirement for cultural plan to be part of the planning system. If every local authority legally had to have a cultural plan and to invest some of the proceeds from uh, regeneration, um, then you know um, there would be at least the beginnings of an endowment fund to do something. Yeah. You know, what happened to um, the one percent thing? Is that well, the one percent kind of got lost. Um, I think it got lost after the lottery was announced. Um, because I think yeah. I think government saw the lottery as the real answer to to the arts funding crisis. I think the lottery. I think all of the creative people got it wrong when the lottery was announced because you know there were a few of us saying actually don't give anybody any money, just buy land, invest in land because it's turning over. You've got to play their game. You know, if you bought land but endowed it, you know you'd be on to a multi-million pound fortune by now, which you could be funding lots and lots and lots of artists, but that's another matter. You've, you've got to have a legal framework and you've got to have a new deal for artists mm. and creative people and it's got to be part of the legal framework and you have it as part of the legal framework. Because what you're dealing with is, is, a, is a historical um, historical thinking which is that anything that to do with the arts comes from discretionary discretionary funding, discretionary mm. rates. And that's always been the kiss of death when bad times come. Um, you've got to have a legal basis to it, and that's got, I mean, it's, it's not difficult to do, it's just you've got to have the will to do it. I think that's right, and, and I'm desperately attracted by the idea of, you know, what we, you know, I spend my life talking to people about how we're going to innovate and be creative, yeah, yeah. and I'm surrounded by the least innovative and the least creative people, you know, in, 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 the, in this bureaucracy, so I just wonder if there's yeah. some way of unlocking yeah. it. Yeah, I'd like to start in the historical Bob's got a good answer there. Yeah. Which, which is completely unapplicable now, but it may, some rogue element may appear, was, was in the 60s, the Arts Council went to R.B. Kittag, gave him a sack of money, £12,000, and told him to go out and buy a collection for the Arts Council. So he went around his mates, bought their work, and gave it to the Arts Council. The best collection in the world, you know? He, of course he bought his mates, but they happened to have been the, you know, the classiest on planet. And so, uh, the well, arguably, uh, yeah. Well, arguably, arguably, yes, but, but you know, pretty damn good. Yeah, I mean, I would want to do that. I don't know if you're the kids, I get well, that and pounds to spend on the mates. Yes, and, and the it, Arts but, but, Council supported John Hoyland to the extent that it did for year after year after year. Don't you like and, John? Do I didn't say John. I didn't like him yes. or I didn't like his work. I mm. just say that some artists were very good at, or seemed okay. to me to be very good at getting all the. Uh, can I Because I think that this, I, I, I totally agree, by the way, this move to the American system and everything. And it won't work because the tax breaks in relationship to the corporate, you know, the reason it works in, 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 in the States is that the actual wealth is, in, is, is enshrined in those tax breaks, you know. We'd have to give an enormous amount of tax away, government would have to, to make the North Americans, and it won't, won't work, it's not going to work. And we don't claim it off the multinationals no, in the first place. No, exactly. <laughs> so that, that, that doesn't work. But I, I, I do think, in parallel with the legal cultural plan, um, you've got to move people's um, kind of view uh, and get to this position that is in the, the North European tradition, which is actually, if you get a certain amount of quality, then you're funded. Um, a lot of money is wasted in working on schemes for an ever-decreasing sum of money um, to who should get it. So we create vast systems of accountability which means yes. avoiding loads and loads of people to make assessments on an ever-decreasing money. It should be very simple. There should be a, 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 a point where if you hit a certain level of um, standard, and I know that's a difficult debate because that's an opinion would be a certain standard, then yes, all sorts of public schemes can be brought on board, like 
you know, God, how many social homes are we building? You know, there's thousands of new social homes. Everyone could have a painting, everyone could have a photograph, everyone could have this, and it could all be arranged without this problem of paying loads of people to simply decide who gets what. Yeah. Which is what happens to them. Which seems to me to be a fabulous point to say, can we have five minutes off to fuel your glasses? There's newcomers who haven't had anything to drink yet, and the rest of us would like to. Is, is that okay? Five, five okay. minute break. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I'm too nice to see you. Yes. It's been really well good. Yeah, it's very yeah. good of you to come. <coughs> Wonderful. Mm. Too far there, right? Where are we? Yeah. Yeah. No, you you had the last word, and it was a. It was well, I always a, try and have the last word. Yeah, and it was, <laughs> it was a good last word. I just can't remember what it was. What about funding? I mean, how to individually fund artists by, you know, embedding it legally within the planning systems, um, you know, in, in, in a social sense, Bob. I mean, I gather that's what, which, you know, would, you know, come back to uh, Tony's Tony's point of the, um, you know, of funding, you know, artists. And when you say based upon, you know, how would one sort of measure, because this is, I mean, this to me is, is, is the, you know, is the key issue in a way, because systems can be evolved. Uh, we're probably lacking many systems that work well for us all. Um, but who, who makes the, who decides? You know, who, who is the judge? You know, the judges, who are the judges in all of this? I agree. It's, 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 it's a it is, that, is, that is a very difficult It is a difficult question, but other countries have got it seemingly to work because we yeah. have other people who are enjoying it and it's working. So yes. Let's go and ask other people where it's working. You know, yes, no, I agree. It, you know, yeah. it's not kind of it has to be an impossible task. Um, but, but, but until you get, in my view, until you become, you know, legally part of, mm. if you like, the mainstream, um, uh, I think it's it's a downward spiral. I think I have I had a conversation in the break on the same. You know, do, do you think a change of government would? But I, I don't see how a change of government can do it unless mm. they're very, very, you know, got a political will um, and, a, and, and a good majority to do something which is fairly revolutionary, you know, because it, it will completely change yes. the way the resources are shared. But it needs that sort of thinking, that sort of revolutionary yeah, thinking. I, I for remember it's walking through Parliament Square in Frank Field, who I did an interview on his art collection. In 1998, Labour had been in for a year, and he'd been sacked as the, as the Social Security Minister, or whatever it was, and Prime Minister. And I remember him saying to me, we've got 180 majority, and we're doing nothing. Mm. We're just continuing the Thatcher right. Now, I don't agree with Frank Field on everything, not by a long shot, but, but you know, his basic point was that it's the Westminster Village is a political stitch up. <coughs> the whole system is, is such. I agree, and I think it's really much harder to change now because yeah. the UK population has become kind of more centric. It's, it, 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 people are kind of suspicious of strong governments now, that's why we're getting coalitions mm -hmm. and can't abide. I mean, you, you know, effectively, you have really good polarised kind of views and get something to work. For sure. And now we need, we need to pick up on Sorry, I don't know. Tim. Tim, Tim was saying it's about the people as well. You know, we need to make sure that every child in every school has an opportunity to experience mm -hmm. every kind of medium, has an opportunity to be presented with real versions, not online, digital, global versions of real works of art, and that we begin to build up the value of art. In the, in the people themselves, then the governments will have to follow in some way. I think that's like, you know, there's a big gap between that and governments following. But, you know, at the moment, we have things, not that for, by any means I'm saying we should do this, but, you know, we have things like the voice and the X factor. And if you go around schools or young places where young people are now, every single one of them is singing. And I'm not saying that that's a good idea. But there is a move to get people to appreciate what's there. And that's the same, I think, with, with art. You've got children who've never been to the seaside. You've got children who've never seen a real piece of work, a real piece of a paint, a genuine painting, a sculpture, touched a sculpture, handled a camera, made a camera, anything. They haven't done that. And unless we do that, people 
children, families will not grow up valuing the art. Yeah. And if they don't grow up valuing it, then this debate yeah. is meaningless. Yeah. It continues yeah. to perpetuate well, the nature of business of bringing artists into schools. I mean, when I was a young girl, we, we were wheeled out regularly and made to perform for school children. It was a nightmare, but you know, curriculum. Sort of curriculum. I, think, I think a lot of the political um, developments that we bail against you know, um, is partly counted and abetted by technology. I mean, it's computer technology, which has become an end in itself rather than yes. a means of it, is, it has a lot, free. <laughs> you, know, you know, has a lot to answer for. Mm. I mean, Ravensbourne, just down the road, I just got the bus from the North Greenwich Tube Station. A friend of mine teaches there. I mean, they don't teach like that. No. It's yeah. all computer. Yes, that's all. Digital art. That's what they call it. Yeah, but, yeah. It's not I think Bob's idea of um, making it a requirement that you have a cultural strategy and that that, that becomes part and parcel of the you know the plan, so to speak, is a is a really good one. But I think there's a couple of things I would say, and again, this may be a difference between London and elsewhere. But um, in a lot of parts of the country, the viability of land and property prices and all things means that there isn't any money in. The land. So in London, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of money, and the developers in London could quite easily put their hand in their pocket and put some money into art. But if you're in Oldham or Blackburn or somewhere else, it's probably a different story. So I'm not sure that's necessarily. But that's the places where they do put their pockets in because that's where you get development for your community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. all the big developments have been that north in impoverished communities. Yeah, they 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 have, but but the the, the chance of there being any additional money out of that in order to fund some Something public new, art. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I think the case for me is that the, the art, the, the art I mean, I'm interested that, you know, it go, if it goes in the London plan, it's going to be even less marginalised than, than, you know, it's going to be even more mainstream and more controlled by government and bureaucrats than it was before, is one, is one thing that worries me. But the, the, the other thing is that I, I think... I think we need to think about, and I think the point was just made about you know getting kids involved and all the rest of it. I think we need to think about the social impact of an exposure to art and culture, and we need to make the case. But yes. isn't the problem? We need to make the case. Isn't, isn't the problem that exposure to art and culture makes people question, yeah. makes people ask? Well, that, and that's what politicians want. Well, they wouldn't let them in the republic. That may be the answer to your... There's lots of little things as well, like, um, you know, which, which we don't do, but we may do elsewhere. Artist resale rights. Oh. Um, you know, now they've started a scheme where you actually get paid if your work appears in books and so on. Okay. That's only recently. But I, you know, I remember back in the 1970s being part of the artist union, campaigning to bring that. The, the people in France were ready to come over and create the model, and it was all set up. And we were lobbying the Labour Party to do it, and they got lobbied by the Bond Street galleries, and, and they they bottled. Um, the other things that were talked about during the GLC years of putting a tax on billboards, advertising billboards, saying, okay, you're making your money out of images and representations. Let's take some money out of that to fund the uh, community arts and so on. Nice. Um, so there's you know, lots of little things as well as the kind of the big things like the, the planning game. I mean, I think that was really key, actually. Um, that, you know, we'd never... But do you not think, though, I mean, often things like art, I mean, is artist resale rights still in operation? I yes. believe it it's, is, isn't it? It yeah. is. It, 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 it is. is. Because it only really benefits those artists who are, you know, sort of in the top echelons. Uh, because I, I, you know, I, th I think if you're lower down the scale, yeah, uh, such as myself, I mean, I've tried artist resale rights. Absolute dead end at the end of the day. No, it's, it's, so it's another payout to the rich, actually. Yes, exactly. That's what that's the, the point I'm making. The way it works now it is. But if, if, it's, if it's operated the way it should be, that if somebody buys your painting oh, yes. and they resell it again oh, yes. at a profit, then yes. you get part of that I, profit. No, I agree. I'm, 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 I'm totally up for that. Yeah. But, you know, is that a how, how, how to get it? <laughs> <laughs> get it sold. So, if I can just come back to, to a couple of points that we brought up. Uh, I'm very glad Peter certainly wasn't actually necessarily disagreeing with me. Um, I wasn't. I was I know. I just said he said what weren't necessarily. No, sorry, Johnny. But the... Two models I put up, and I still stand by, but I'd like to elaborate on that a tiny bit. But I think, you know, in a way, you have a culture of a model. 
And while culturally, yes, the American model culturally works well in North America, you know, there is a huge amount of support for various artistic ventures. Uh, I don't agree with neo neoliberalism, and, you know, but that's my political position. There is not in this country a neoliberal cultural position on, on the arts. Uh, with just a few little exceptions like the whole question of Sachi and Sachi's uh, intervention into, into the art world and into private organisations like the Royal Academy, you know, which are monarchically uh, sponsored. Mm. Uh, but with the exception of that, there's not a big deal. And I'm really saying that at the moment we're simply falling between the two models and actually not doing very well at either one. Now, I'm, I'm just suggesting that it would be look, worth looking again at the social democratic model, and by social democracy I mean you know, not the social, you know, the Democrats or anything like that. Um, I'm talking about that model whereby you actually have a concrete idea about what you're doing with culture. It was the Minister of Culture, the first Minister of Culture in the Austrian government, wrote an amazing book, and I wish people would still read it. It's called The Necessity of Art by Jens Fischer. <coughs> and what he said was that Art is actually necessary. You know, it is not just a luxury. You can tell we've got an art dealer with it. It is. It is. It is a social necessity. Now, going, you know, just following that, uh, the in terms of education, I was pleased that you brought up the question of education. I brought up the question about twenty-four pence spent on art on materials per child per year. Now. What happened with the last Labour administration was that the arts actually suffered very, very badly until quite towards the end. And towards the end, all of a sudden, there was a great idea that came out that the school curriculum time would be released for 20% precisely to involve art into education. Which is a great idea. A great idea, yeah. and yeah. tragically it came at the end of the administration. Yeah. Bob, what were you going to say? Yeah. I was just reflecting on that for a minute, but um, I agree with the last comment, though I think you're judging very harshly the last Labour government in terms of, of, of the way that resources went into. Um, I'll argue that actually, you know, that those 10 years, you know, you did see the advocacy for engagement and education, all those things were done incredibly well, it took some great, great success. Um, but uh, the, the conundrum I, I find really frightening, and I, I suppose I, I would say to any budding artist um, who's got interest in politics to, you know, to find a way of tackling the treasury, because I find it kind of weird that here, here we, we've now made the case for the value of creativity. In, in economic terms. And it is the creative arts that is earning this country money now. Very little else is earning this country money. It's the knowledge economy that is driving our, uh, our economy. Um, and therefore earning what taxes that do come in. You know, and yet, I mean, I know people that have lobbied the Chancellor who's basically said it ain't going to change. Now, that's the problem. It's getting to get people to understand that the deal, the tax deal back for the creative industries has is, 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 is got to be made good and it's not. Can, I, can we um, interject a little bit? We've gone into a much bigger pool than we kind of anticipated. Right. <laughs> not with this being a bunch of artists talking about art. But the, the irony is, you know, we've lost this great art school network. Oh, indeed we have. I mean, we have. Yes, okay, no question. Let's not beat her up out of the bush. But the irony is that over the last 20 years, certainly 30 years, the, you know, this country has been won over, if you like, for abstract art at least. I mean, Rothko in yes, the department know, stores yeah. and, you know, the coffee shops everywhere, got William Scott's and, you know, the, everything. You know, the, the whole taste now, um, art has become a popular, trendy thing. 
it, that doesn't mean that everybody goes out and seriously buys it or seriously studies it or looks at it, but, but art generally is now in the public consciousness. Now, Nick Sorota would no doubt take, want to take some credit for that, and the whole Tate policy, the Tate modern with bumps on seats and expanding it, but, but at a great aesthetic price, you know, dumbing down and, you know, the satirization and all the rest of it. Yeah. But, but, the irony but just because you're on the fridge map note, it doesn't mean to say that your art is appreciated. Do you know the, the, the underlying uh, text? It shows something, it shows you've been commodified. Don't you? Yes. But the, the actual business. It has to be why you did buy your dinner or not. I don't know. Quite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a real problem with everything they're fond of these days, and that for, I think, very good reasons, these things have to be evaluated and justified and so on, and they should be transparent and everything else. And you end up, if you're an academic, with a research test exercise, or whatever it's now called, and it's phenomenally expensive, and it changes the nature of research and academic life, because everything is now busy publishing and writing journals, and preparing submissions, and so on, and the actual research isn't getting done. Um, and I don't see how you avoid that with state funding in the current climate. We know Bob was talking about giving money to Paul Viner, it's called to call it. But you have to assess that and assess the source. So I'm, I'm not sure if state funding is ever going to be the answer. Are you saying withdraw state funding completely? No. I mean, well, allow, just allow, allow you know, things to float to the surface. Well, that, well or perhaps, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I've never, as an artist, I've never been state funded apart from my education in my life. And um, your teaching, so, Peter. I, I mean, all the yeah. teaching has been well, subsidised. Well, that, of course, subsidised in the sense I, I've, 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 yes, I've worked on a part time, full time basis in order to subsidise myself. Yeah, sure, um, sure. But the state in the state subsidised the Claire, you were trying to say true. something. No, I'm just, just thinking, what is it actually that we want to achieve? Do, 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 we, do we actually want people to have stuff on their walls that makes them feel happier or more enriched or that you know, prompts thoughts that they wouldn't otherwise have had? I think that's very tough because people can't afford that. Mm -hmm. Most people can't afford that, which is why the proliferation through Athena and you know, the Blue Lady and Cheap Prints is actually possibly the best thing that an awful lot of people are going to achieve, and at least that's something. But I don't know what, you know, that, that's my question. Or, or actually, are we more looking at getting people to create something? So it's the access to creativity mm -hmm. in schools, the access to having the materials to be able to do something themselves. To feel that creativity is an endemic part of their existence and their life. Sure. And that they... What is it we're actually aiming at? Well, if, you know, if I could answer given... that from my, my point of view, um, I, all I'm interested in is how I make a living doing what I want, which is an appallingly selfish stance to take. But I have to amend that by saying Athena have gone bankrupt. They, they are no longer functioning. People don't buy posters anymore. They never buy the posters. Oh, creativity is digital now. Creativity is digital. Um, but people do put things on their walls. I'm talking about young people. Young, young, young people still have Bob Dylan. Um, you know, the woman by the tennis net. The do they still? Yeah, they do. Yeah. So Jack, Jack has on his yeah, ball. In five years' time, they'll only have one poster on the wall because it will change between those five images. Yeah. It's yeah. by itself. Yeah. You, can, you can get some amazing things on eBay if you're a Chinese artist. I mean, what about Brenda Place your order. What about Brenda Ormsley after the war at school prints? Oh, yeah. I mean, that whole concept. Yeah. What's yeah, well, I mean, it was. It was they're for sale again, you can get reprints, I saw. The teeth catalogue. Yeah, the teeth catalogue. So, uh, and they've gone up in money. I mean, the whole so project that prints in schools, you know, because it was yes. affordable and it was. And they were down the school corridors. Yeah. Always. And the addition was 3,000 or something. Like okay. Yeah. Um, and what should people have at home? Gosh. Well, my we'll choose wife. them. <laughs> but, but actually, well, what we can say is the CASA can do it and, and give stuff away free to London schools, then I think we could come up with something as good as that. The grand old CASA wants to get it, I think that's good. I shouldn't make any of the people you want.
people generally have in their homes, what matches their carpet? Oh, yeah. it's the same yes, method as the hotels use, isn't it? Yeah. Very often. It's, it's yeah. Very often. It's not people's houses are based on that. Well, there, in the digital field, there are so many new economic models surfacing that I think it might be worth looking towards them. You know, for example, in the whole gaming thing, mm. you know, people get games for free, they can play games for free, but they are subsidised either to advertising on the same site or the people who are really interested in buying the special uh, kind of games, yes. gizmos that go with it, and that subsidises the others for free. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so these new economic models that are coming from the net, you know, the idea of one's images being copyrighted and being out there mm. and then being paid for, the use of them being mm. paid for, you know, might be a, a model worth thinking about how you actually make that work. Well, the British Library do that. They're, yeah. they're excellent. Yeah. I mean, no, I was just thinking about the libraries of the books. I mean, yes. you've got painting libraries. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, well, it's, it's, British Library. Like, sorry? Like, sorry? The British Library used to have a, a painting library. Did they? What's the name of that gallery that does the standardised paintings? Uh, there's one in one in Madrid, and there's one where else have I seen them? Um, I think there's one in London somewhere. Madrid is standard size. You can you can buy twenty by twenties or thirty by twenties yeah. or so, and they're, they're all the same price. They have a set of different artists who just churn out rather similar. Oh. But at least it's real art, and it's a kind of step on the ladder for people. You can buy them at a price that anybody can afford. Well, so I was saying, on, on eBay, the Chinese artists, I mean, you can get... Yeah, but, but, but these are local artists, yeah. tend to be. Oh. So oh, that, and and it's a really to... nice uh, marketing yeah. device. You get to city centres where the art tourists and people go around looking for things to buy, and it's actually, you know, it's, it's uh, tens of pounds rather than hundreds. Mm. So you can afford to buy art too, and it gets people hooked on the idea of course, they can own some art. And I just wonder whether that model could kind of be extended mm. somewhere. Or maybe you could have artists doing real just doodles and getting them into schools and selling them for numbers of pounds rather than tens of pounds just to get well, the kids involved in the idea that they could buy a real piece of art and yeah. so on. Well, what I'm interested <laughs> in as well, though, is I mean, do, do we believe that the avant garde still exists? And mm. do we. Have a, you know, sort of is, it doesn't mean anything, is probably the quick answer, isn't it? Sorry? Yes, it, no, it doesn't mean anything. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, Simon Effing Cowell is this new avant God. Who's Simon Effing Cowell? Who's Simon Effing Cowell? Cowell, you know, ex factor, that idiot. Oh, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. And also, I'd, I'd like to ask a question from Bob. What would you regard as the avant God within politics in the current present time? Uh, Cable. 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 <laughs> 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 I mean, does, does the avant garde only thing. exist within the arts? I mean, is that, is that um, you know, sort of only. Yeah, I think formally speaking, I mean, it's, it's an art movement. And well, you were talking about the rate of change earlier. Yes. And really, I mean, it's probably true of all human creativity that there's been a kind of historical, general trend that mm. the rate of change gets faster and faster over history. People, I mean, archaeologists, date things by the fashions and the artefacts found in Neolithic places because people did make artefacts even then. Mm. And that's going, that rate of change gets shorter and shorter, but the, it's not, oh, that's only really generally, because the modern movement, when it appeared, was a period of really rapid change. It was oh, a yeah. sudden yeah. change, which has actually stopped dead to all intents and purposes ever since. Well, absolutely. Well, we I mean, got I'm the idea from the modern movement mm that change for its own sake was worthwhile. And so all we get now is a kind of vapid cycling of changes. I'm talking as an architect here that mm. uh, postmodernism in architecture was nothing more than film set. Robert Hughes yeah. and Man Ray both said there is no such thing as change, you know. Just but, but I mean what, what what I'm interested in is whether change as such, you know, avant garde based upon change is about something new, or whether it's merely a reinvention it's or a new it's look it's about It's a commercial it gimmick, in my opinion, now, yeah. and I think that... Marketing device. A marketing device. Oh, yes, it's that's... Fashion-led, yeah. fashion it's fashion-led, all the way. It's yeah. fashion has changed a bit yeah. more different. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, you could say that individual artists, you know, creating 
I mean, in the way you're, I mean, it's, it's like in the way vanilla, what you're doing with your work, which I really appreciate, I think it's fantastic, you know, is that you are appealing to a certain other person's taste. On a good day. On a good day. You know, I mean that. You know, I mean that's. And we're all doing that. But that's not my intention. I don't think. No, no, you, you're not thinking that. When no, you're doing no, it. But, but I mean that's uh, in terms of uh, you know what you're saying about trying to market the work. Mm -hmm. You know, in the sense of trying to live on it. That is in effect what you're what you're doing. Is what I'm doing. What all of us doing you know, within that sphere is that we are. You know, you're selling your own particular taste yes. to to others. I mean, and you're trying for them to concur. Yes. With your, with your, with your when the idea of avant-garde meant something, it was because people doing what you're describing were actually leading yes. taste. They were going places that people hadn't yet wandered into, at least not in the recent mm. past, let's say. Mm. They were uh, uh, moving the cycle of, of ideas forward. But it's, okay. now it's merely a, 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 another marketing gimmick. It's kind of a commodity itself. I'm just like that taste change from value to stuff. I've been trying to say something for ages. No, I, I, I just want to elucidate on this on this question of the avant garde, and um, you know, the it's getting goes back to this book, The Necessity of Art, which is great. I think you can read it. Uh, it's probably out of print, but you probably find it in the library. Um, but the avant garde is really quite simply a technical artistic uh, position of attacking the academies. You know, so if, if the power of academies. In, in terms of arts study and you know developing young artists are no longer important. Then you know almost by definition you can't have an avant-garde. <laughs> However, what well, I would say that for any artist, you should always say yes. The art should be uh, you know from yourself and it should be you. Yeah. Because otherwise there's no point in doing it. You know. Otherwise, you might do the most beautiful piece of art. You know fine artwork or painting, whatever, uh, and you could actually directly copy someone. It'd be a great piece of craft, but it's not art. Art is about something which is from yourself and something that is new. Yeah, what is art? I mean, that, oh. art can do shoulders, that's it. I mean, everything's art. I mean, just literally now, really. It's just like a cabinet of curiosity. That's what your galleries are an art. An art, literally. <laughs> oh, good idea. Yes, yes. You know. It, it's, it's difficult to know where to draw the distinction yeah. because I was just yeah. thinking as you were talking, yeah. you were drawing through space with your hands. I could call that drawing. I could, yeah, I could define I could, like myself. I could define we are drawing with each other. Yeah. But whether you would actually call that drawing, whether you know you could define that. Um, yeah. you know. And I was thinking, kind of curiosity, yeah. and we've got a voice. You know. There is a competition for air guitar. Competition oh, yes. for air guitar, you know? Okay. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. So, why would it not be air art? Yes. Oh, exactly, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. 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 Of course, of course, um, these art movements we're talking about at uh, the beginning of the century that, that you know, were called the avant-garde believed that they were actually in some way going to change society, that, that the, the perceptions they, they were offering were, was going to puncture bourgeois tastes, um, that it was going to somehow contribute to a better world, etc., etc. Now, very utopian, and we you know it didn't happen. Um, well, it did, it, did, it, did, it did partly happen. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's easy to say it failed and it didn't make the impact. That's easy to say that, and obviously to some extent that's true that it failed, but it didn't completely fail. It, it, well, I don't think it failed at all. I mean, the fact that we're here talking about it, it's, it's, you know, we're not talking about it. It didn't fail, it was actually stopped. Mm. Just like yes. all of the freedom-related political ideas of the uh, late 50s, 60s, and possibly early 70s were actually stopped. Were stopped. Or did it stop? Some were of them were stopped, stopped and some they, of them were co-opted. They, they were, well, one way or another, they were prevented from any fruition by people who had power to do so and didn't want the disturbance in the order of the, the status quo ante. 
And, and is that the kind of organic process that there's this challenge and the charge and then the pulling back and the protection of the status quo? I think it probably is, but, so it's, it's, it's but, 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 but the thing? retrenchment has, has been quite awful. Yes, mm. yes, it is. But, but what I was going to go on to say things. about that is that there seems to be a cynicism now amongst a lot of our citizens um, that we can't change anything with our art anyway. Um, mm. So we just, you know, Garrett, which is a, you know, it's no longer a physical place, but bed Garrett, uh, and we just get on with producing our work and survive the best we can. On the margin. Hmm? On the margin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Which is where most people are. Yeah. Shall we call it a day at that? And hit the bottle. I, I think it's been a very, very interesting discussion. I think we've all... Uh, oh, Tim's one more. Yeah, no, one I'd, like to apology. My apology. I'd like to invite everybody to APT Open Studios. The yeah. card has been delayed. It's next Friday, uh, 6 o'clock till 9. Uh, and on Saturday, Sunday, 1 o'clock till 5. Everyone's very welcome. Lots of things going on. Thank you. And apologies. Uh, thank you, Tim. And thank you, everybody, yeah. for coming. What an interesting yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. The booze is still going yeah. strong. Let's drink. Let's break it.